Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. And today I'm going to explain how concrete and concrete slabs work and explain a bit further on what led to the punching shear failure of the slab that ultimately caused the collapse of the building. For those new to the channel, I'm a professionally qualified structural engineer in the UK and I'm covering this topic because it is important to learn about collapse on a real case study. It helps us grow as engineers and it doesn't matter if it's local to me or international, engineering is global. So I've run the numbers on punching shear failure based from a 3D analysis model I made and based on the loadings under unfactored loadings, the design works, but just about. So for people who are unfamiliar with how engineers design something, we have what we call a code of practice and every country uses their own. In America, we use ACI 318 for concrete structures. In the UK, we use the Eurico 2. When we do our design, we have to apply a load so there are fundamentally two types of loads that we apply to gravity design, dead and live loads. The dead loads are loads which we would consider permanent, such as the self-weight of the structure and the finishes applied to the floor, such as carpets, tiles or the ceiling. The live load is what we call a variable load. Load flat can change depending on the usage. So for a residential building, the loading we use in the UK is 1.5 kPa. But if the building was used as a gym, the loading we would apply in the UK is 5 kPa. The loadings that we apply is found in respective codes of practice. Whichever code you choose to use, we have safety factors that we apply to our designs or calculations for extra protection. The safety factors that we apply vary between codes, but they are there to cover construction tolerances or buildability issues. What I have checked is that if you apply the factored loadings to the punching shear design, it does not pass. It does, however, pass when you apply unfactored loads. So what this means is the design is not code compliant. However, not being code compliant does not mean that a building is going to fall down. What I have calculated and checked is that the slab should not have failed under normal use or loadings. So what went wrong? The channel Building Integrity has done a good video explaining in depth the punching shear failure and reviewing the concrete core samples. So feel free to go check that video out for more information. What I want to talk about in this video is what caused the degradation that led to the slab to fail in punching shear. It's fairly well documented that there was a lack of waterproofing membrane or the waterproofing membrane which they installed got damaged and failed. What I want from these videos is to educate people. And what's been really great from my previous videos covering this collapse is that a lot of non-engineering people or laymen are actually really interested on what's going on. So I think it would be worth going back to basics and explaining how concrete in a building structure actually behaves. So concrete is actually inherently waterproof. Concrete is made from cement, sand, aggregate, and water. And what we call a concrete mix determines the strength of the concrete. The water reacts with the cement, which actually makes it stronger. And the chemical reaction never actually ends, and the concrete actually increases in strength over time because of this reaction. Concrete is great in resisting compression. So think of compression as a pushing force. Using concrete to make columns is great because the majority of the forces are compression forces. Concrete, however, is bad in resisting tension forces. So think of tension as a pulling force. The reinforcement in a concrete section, such as a beam or a slab, is there to resist the tension forces. So you might be thinking, where do the tension or pulling forces occur in a beam or a slab? Well, if a beam bends between two supports, you get bending in the middle. When you get bending, you get a tension side and a compression side. So the bottom of a beam is in tension and the top is in compression. So for a beam bending between two supports, you want to put the reinforcement in the middle bottom section of the beam to resist the bending of the tension forces due to bending. A beam or a slab can also bend at the support, and this is what we call a continuous slab or beam. So because a slab can bend at the support, the tension side is actually now at the top of the slab instead of the bottom when it was bending in the middle. It's really important to know that concrete structures are actually designed to crack, and concrete structures will crack, and this is absolutely normal. Cracks will tend to form where there is tension. When we design concrete structures, we design to limit crack widths. So essentially, we design to limit the size of the crack that can develop. So the reason we want to limit the crack width is to limit the amount of water that can penetrate the concrete. I said earlier that concrete is inherently waterproof. Well, it is still waterproof, even if there are small cracks in the concrete. But we are talking crack widths are about 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters wide. 
What also helps protect the reinforcement within the concrete is what we call concrete cover. And this is the concrete from the edge of the concrete element to the reinforcement. The greater the cover, the more protection. What's really important to understand why we limit crack widths is because limiting crack widths to 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters means that the crack won't propagate deep into the concrete or it won't crack far enough to go beyond the concrete cover and corrode the reinforcement. Knowing all this now, you can probably guess where I'm heading with this. What I think has happened is the slab has cracked too much around the columns, which is where the tension is. The waterproofing has failed and allowed too much water to be in contact with the top of the concrete slab. In normal cases, this should have been okay, but because the cracks were too large, the water has penetrated deep into the concrete and corroded the reinforcement. Over time, this corrodes the reinforcement, the reinforcement rusts and it expands, which causes the concrete to spall or break away. And this spalling or concrete separation is what building integrity called delamination of the concrete, which causes the slab to fail in punching shear like this instead of like this. From my previous video, my theory was that the building collapsed because of a punching shear failure in the slab. Having done some calculations and looked at the numbers, I'm actually quite comfortable in backing up that theory. I think that the original design was not co-compliant. However, I think the design was still fine and it shouldn't have collapsed. What I think has happened is water ingress has caused the reinforcement within the concrete to corrode and rust and expand, causing the concrete to basically spool and break away and causing this kind of delamination. Punching shear is completely reliant on the reinforcement and the lack of shear links because at the time they weren't really used to counter or resist a punching shear failure. At the time they used just a standard reinforcement and they utilised this rebar to resist the punching shear. So having done the numbers I know how sensitive the design is to you know sort of any weakening of the reinforcement. I think the reinforcement has been weakening for a long period of time and once that reinforcement has weakened to a point beyond failure, that is when the collapse has happened. And once that initial punching shear failure happened in the sort of car park deck slab, it essentially caused a chain reaction of failures causing the whole building to collapse because of a lack of robustness, which is what I talk about in my previous videos. Thank you for watching. It's really important to understand that this kind of investigative work to try and find out the cause of failure for a building structure is a progressive thing and it does take a lot of time to uncover things piece by piece. I hope my videos have shown a progression on how I've come and developed my theory. If you've enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.